Hi everyone, you know what time it is, Blender 4.4 is here and Modular Workspaces 1.9 because we got that out just in time. So of course today what we're going to do is have a quick look through the new feature page as we always do. It's become a bit of a tradition now where we just sit down and take a look at what's changed and I share a few thoughts as we go. So I've already had a very quick look through this page and this update might not be as exciting as some of the previous ones depending on what kind of features you're interested in but there have been a lot of kind of stability improvements in this one and as you can see probably one of my favorite splash screens in quite a long time actually we've got a lovely cover artwork from flow the animated film made with eevee that just won an academy award so that's really nice to see so time for action improved animation workflow better modeling a new sculpt brush and smoother video editing plus over 700 issues fixed there was a big focus on stability this time now as usual blender do their own videos of course and there's some nice examples of the work on the showcase reel of course starting off with flow it seems to be a thing that you know we're all celebrating at the moment so it was just very nice to see but they're always worth having a look through for some inspiration but you can do that in your own time and likewise if they want to go into a bit more detail in some of the features then they get Jonathan Lampel who by the way again is super lovely and supportive to do their own explanation of the features so those are the official videos but let's carry on so in terms of the fixes and stability they had something that they called the winter of quality which they're mentioning right here first and foremost at the top of the page because it seems like the thing that they invested most of the effort into Blender 4.4 is all about stability, as they say. During the 2024 to 25 Northern Hemisphere winter, Blender developers doubled down on quality and stability in a group effort called the Winter of Quality. In just a few months, developers fixed over 700 reported issues, revisiting old bug reports and addressed unreported problems. Alongside bug fixes, Winter of Quality also included tackling technical debt and improving documentation. So that's something with software development that, well, I probably need to learn a bit more about, but it's always good going back and tidying up legacy code because you never know how long ago it was written and Blender has been around for a while now. So I've heard from a friend that there are little bits of code in there that haven't been touched since like the uh, early 2000s. And just because something's been part of the software for a while it doesn't mean it can't be improved or made more efficient so they've got a nice little graph here just as a little visual marker showing how the number of high severity bugs has reduced over time and it looks like just in terms of numbers the heaviest categories for fixes were the user interface and grease pencil I wonder what these were. I mean, we can actually click through and have a look, but it'll be a bit too boring to read through all of those, but it's nice. It's all there if you actually want to have a look. Blender brought receipts to the table. I wonder if there were any bugs that I wanted to get fixed. Okay, so animation is also an area of 4.4 that's getting a lot of attention this time, kind of taking over from geometry nodes for a little bit. Blender 4.4 introduces action slots, revolutionizing animation workflows by letting multiple data blocks share a single action. Not my field of expertise, but more animation features in Blender are kind of, maybe not essential, but really useful for the adoption of Blender in groups or startups or just studios in general that are participating in this new wave of animated shows and films that seems to have been revitalized after you know, Spider-Verse, Arcane, Flow now and all of that. Before action slots, each data block specific animation, like an object's position, a camera's depth of field, or a material's shader properties, needed its own separate action. This made it difficult to animate multiple elements together or share animations between objects or even projects. For example, if you wanted to animate a camera moving while also changing its depth of field, you'd need two separate actions, which couldn't be easily linked or reused. Now you can mix all sorts of animations, such as an object's position, its material properties, even compositing effects, all within a single action. So this sounds like an important workflow efficiency. Again, you can click through to read the manual. Let's have a quick look. They've got a section here under actions. We have action slots. So there's a deeper explanation there. Again, the amount of effort they put into the documentation and I say it like in every video, but this page as well, it's a lot. And these are still fairly frequent like Blender updates. They reduce the update frequency slightly, but the effort to have to do like all the imagery that we're seeing on the screen here and just bundle all the info together never sees is to amaze me. There are more changes for the animations to do the constraints, graph editor, rigging, Python API. I wonder what it means by conceptual changes in the API. That's a dangerous term. <laughs> and pose library. Wait, what do they mean by conceptual changes? A new Python API for slots, layers, strips is probably just making it easier to interact with the animation system through the Python API now, which means that you're likely to get more powerful animation-based add-ons in the future. Fine, that's great. 
So the video sequence editor, VSE, vastly superior editing. The video sequencer continues to improve with quality of life upgrades for text editing, expanded support for codecs, including H.265 and 10 slash 12 bit videos, and performance improvements that make editing faster than ever. Edit text on the spot, introducing edit mode for text strips in preview. Well, that's cool. It's something that we take for granted in like every other editing software, but the more capability the VSC in Blender has, the better, especially for taking over, you know, of the open source space of video editing. I mean, the VSC in Blender has mainly been for if you're working with stuff that you're making in Blender in the sequencer, but I do know some people that use it as a, their proper video editor, which is brave, but look, that's becoming more and more valid as an option as they keep adding these features. Multi-line text strips can now be properly aligned to the left, right, or center. Building proxies for image sequences is faster. Great. We really hate slow caching when it comes to editing. Preview playback performance of float or high dynamic range content is faster. More speed Speed improvements, uh, more modifier speed improvements, and a bunch of sequencer effects also being faster. Wow, yeah, so again, every update it seems like they keep finding things literally everywhere in Blender to make more efficient. Imagine if our most used proprietary softwares, not to name names, Adobe, put that much effort into things. Blender 4.4 adds support for rendering videos using the H.265 slash HEVC codec. Again, this is just more changes bringing it up to standard, making color spaces consistent. Yeah, just more, more, more. Really good to see. Now, this next one is less of a Blender feature and more of a reminder about the Blender extensions platform. So it is technically a feature in the way that it's integrated into your user preferences in Blender. This is a way you can link up to add-ons, which you can have auto update as they're updated on the extensions platform. If you don't know about it, though, it only applies to free add-ons GPL compliant, they have to go through a review process. So it can take a little while to get things actually put on there, but there are over 500 free add-ons available for you to try and it also supports themes as well. So if you like, you can have a little peruse through and they're very easy to access from inside of Blender. Okay, so this is what I would consider to be one of the larger sections of this update, modeling changes. We don't very often get modeling improvements, like finite modeling improvements. So this is actually quite interesting for me. Like a lot of the heavy lifting for modeling efficiency tools has been done by add-on developers. So it's nice to see some love here. Modeling, pole position. A new option in the select by trait operator lets you select by pole count. If you don't know what that means, then if you've got a vertex surrounded by other vertices, then the number of connections would effectively be your pole count. So you can easily find all three pole or five pole points in your mesh. Given their impact on topology, the default selects all poles that do not have four edges, allowing for easy inspection. So that's quite handy if you're being quite thorough and rigorous with trying to build perfect like quad topology around an object. You'll be able to find structural inconsistencies there, which you could work on. Next section, influencer. Joining triangles to quads now prioritizes quad dominant topology, creating a more structured grid layout. This helps maintain cleaner geometry and improves mesh flow, especially in models where uniform quads are preferred. This behavior can be adjusted using a topology influence factor to better control how triangles are merged. So the demonstration here is pretty clear with the topology influence of 0 and 1.0, and we could see that the 1.0 is far more authentic to the potential quad layout of the geometry. So that's great for cleaning up meshes and again, kind of like assisting with that retopology workflow. So vertex and edge dissolve. Dissolving edges may remove additional unselected edges to ensure the mesh remains valid. Previously, this also dissolved vertices connected to those unselected edges. The new behavior processes only vertices that belonged to the selected, now dissolved edges. Okay, so let's quickly explain this diagram because it looks a bit confusing on first glance. So we're going from the columns left to right. So the dissolving functionality is largely the same for Blender 4.3 and 4.4, but you'll notice that we've got this line of edges here and we're removing these two active ones. The same functionality applies in 4.3 and 4. If you're removing the two edges, there's a shared vertex in the middle there and it's gonna dissolve that and the line's gonna straighten. If there was no other edge underneath, then when you remove these two, then that vertex is still not connected to any Thing, so there's no point in it being there. So that's removed in 4.3 and 4.4 because it's not kind of structurally bound to anything. However, despite it not being structurally bound to something, removing it isn't going to affect anything else in the mesh because we can see that we have this shape supported by the edge that's sitting in there. And that situation changes for the last one where this shape here, the supporting edge is removed. So when we get rid of the edges around this unbound vertex. In Blender 4.3 it would delete it but because there's no supporting edge in that shape this additional vertex is removed and then it flattens and maybe that's not what you want because that's influencing the shape of the mesh kind of outside of what you had originally asked Blender to do so that's why 
In the more recent version, it's a subtle but quite important change. You remove the unbound vertex, but it does not affect the neighboring vertices. But I think that's dependent on other specific factors which are explained elsewhere. But that's why it says the new behavior processes only vertices that belonged to the selected now dissolved edges. So really only that single one that we unbound without affecting the others. Sorry if that was like a bit of a convoluted explanation. Now there are more miscellaneous modeling improvements. So let's get to sculpting. Stay grounded or reach new heights with a a new sculpt brush type plane. Oh, we already had a kind of like planar and really kind of scraping type, but a dedicated plane sculpting is going to be super exciting for hard surface sculpting. Can't wait to have a go with that. The plane brush is a generalization of the existing flatten fill and scrape brushes. You see, we already had ways to do similar things, but I guess this is more powerful. With new options to control stabilization and range of influence above and below the brush plane. Key features include adjustable height above the brush plane, depth control for vertices below it, and an option to invert these settings. Stabilization options for the normal, the brush's plane orientation, and plane's position are also available for precise control. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to having a proper play with that actually i've been using nomad sculpt on the ipad and i mean i was recommended to give it a try for quite a while and when you play with it you can kind of see how far behind blender is with some sculpting quality should we say everything feels so much more fluid on something like nomad but i guess it makes sense because it's a dedicated sculpting software but of course just like the other areas there are a few more sculpt changes included i can't wait to see more improvements to that in the future as well user interface window decorations now follow the theme colors on windows 11 and mac os I need to play with that. New window decorations on Windows 11. Hmm, something I don't know much about. But I do love the extensibility of Blender themes and it has traditionally been a little bit difficult to modify Blender themes in the way that we wish there was just like a basic palette you could control. You know, you have to kind of keep in mind all the color values and then go and replace them wherever they appear. So making it a bit easier to modify, all for that. Especially now since we've got the themes available on the Blender extensions platform. Snap into place. Editors now softly snap to minimum and maximum sizes with improved splitting previews and docking feedback. They've been doing a lot of work on this, like the last few versions. The snapping functionality in Blender was always like this big mystery that was really difficult for newcomers to wrap their head around. But I think there was something kind of sacred about it. It's interesting seeing it being modernized a bit more and made a bit more handy. Although I will say, maybe it's just muscle memory. I'd gotten really used to the kind of old snapping functionality. And now with this new version, I'm stuck in that old beginner loop of like accidentally opening things and then having trouble closing them again. It's probably just muscle memory. I'm kind of more used to it in the way that there wasn't like a big thick bar that kind of gets in the way of your interpretation of the cursor position. But, you know, I'll get used to it. Oh, and scroll bars are hidden for small editors. I did notice as well that the, the scroll bar kind of hides itself, which is actually like a really nice thing. Oh, they mentioned that here. Horizontal scroll bars are now hidden automatically when they don't fit in the editor. In node editors, inputs that can't affect output are now grayed out for node groups or for group nodes. Wait, same difference. Geometry nodes modifiers and node tools. So that's going to give you a really easy and clear indication as to whether something is actually affecting what's happening in the calculation. So again, lovely usability improvements or user experience improvements. Now there are other editor improvements as well. Don't worry, I won't read through all of them, but they are there and available. But let me pay attention to maybe the asset browser. Because again, like I said at the beginning, we've just released modular workspaces 1.9, which is fully compatible with Blender 4.4, featuring a whole new way to customize how your asset browser opens by default. When you enable it with the toggle buttons, we've added new things for you to use. You can customize your asset browser defaults for different workspaces got more customization over how the toggle buttons look we've got a pie menu so you can quick split your 3d view into different editors it's worth having a look at if you haven't checked it out already i mean i originally put the add-on together to help myself with my own workflows so maybe you'll find it useful as well but anyway the asset browser new default sorting option assets are now sorted by catalog instead of name okay fine new operator to remove asset preview available in the asset browser sidebar and brush names are easier to read with live theme okay just kind of small things but nice to have now let's move down a bit more. So Mac OS, wow, the, what is it? Five to 15% of you that use Mac OS Blender? I think it's something around there. On Mac OS, you can now preview blend file contents in a thumbnail in Finder, App Expose and Spotlight. Pretty, I mean, actually it is quite nice to have like previews there for the blend files. That does look quite pretty. Cool. And then a whole bunch of user interface changes. A lot. A lot of small things added. But we'll move on from all of the micro changes because we'll be here forever. So for the compositor, more speed. Speed, speed, speed. The CPU compositor was rewritten to pave the way for future development. 
Excellent. Thank you. After all the years of like complaining about compositor speed, the rewrite provides significant improvements in performance in certain configurations of some nodes, caching of static resources like images, and less memory usage on node setups, with many nodes that operate on pixels. Filter nodes are also particularly faster now. The levels node is up to 10 times faster, the filter and Kuwahara are twice as fast, the blur nodes up to 4 times faster, which is great actually because I know blur effects and a lot of softwares are typically quite inefficient. So that's a good one. The glare filter is not only more advanced now, but it's also six times more performant and the pixelate node is nine times faster. Adjusting the compositor node trees can be significantly faster and more interactive. And that's because it avoids computing outputs that aren't viewed by the user through the backdrop or image editor. Okay, great. No excessive unnecessary computation while the user is actually interacting with the interface. The overall compositing experience should now feel more responsive whether you're using the CPU or GPU. Fantastic, no complaints. Good to have as well. And now it's becoming a really good time for like, if you're like a resource developer making uh, compositor node groups and stuff to share with people or to sell or just to have fun with. It was never really that viable, but it was always kind of on the table as like, hey, that's something that could be fun to do in the future. But now that the compositor is getting hell of a lot better and we've got the real time compositor as well, it's way more viable now. So to get more specific with the glare node, we have the glare glow up. The glare node got a major revamp for better control and usability. Most of the node options are now input sockets you can connect. Great, that was actually one of my complaints about it like in our second to last video when I was doing a startup file, I was complaining that you can actually use them as inputs and now hey like a few days later my complaints have been smited. Wonderful. New outputs, generated glare and highlights are now exposed as output sockets. A new strength input lets you adjust glare intensity. Again I mentioned that in that video as well. I said is there a strength or is it just mix? But no, they've literally just straight up put a strength value in there. Fog, glow, and bloom sizes are now linear and scale properly. More realistic, energy conserving, and properly scaled bloom. Adjust glare saturation and tint with dedicated inputs. I've got to, okay, I've got to play with that then. I love it when a plan comes together, you know, sometimes it happens. You have a request, you throw it out into the ether, and then woof, it just appears. But no, I'm sure they worked on that like ages ago, and I just so happened to have complained about it. I'm sure if I did the research, I would have known straight away. All right, let's carry on. So of course, again, Again, just like every other section, more compositor changes. Support for integer sockets, new quality option of open image denoise. Okay, cool. Because I use that node quite a lot, actually, the denoise node. For like mixing render with denoise versions, you can get a control between like how denoise something actually is. That's great. And a side note about studio confidence. All library versions used in Blender 4.4 are aligned with the visual effects reference platform 2025, making studio pipeline integration and maintenance easier. And now finally we are coming to the end, but wait, there's more. And as usual, when I get to the section, I say that's all well and good, but what are the Python changes? Complete list of API breaking changes. Well, thank God I have help with at least some help on one of the add-ons. Thank you again, Gixo. Because I've not always been in the headspace for doing Python coding. You know, it's a very hyper-specific mood to be in. But again, I appreciate all of the information that's provided here. Now for this section, of course, credits. Thank you to all the developers, but also thank you to everyone who contributes to Blender, including me and you probably, maybe. Do you donate? I do. Not that you have to, obviously everyone's in a different financial situation, but if you can, if you have any funds available, every little helps. The fact that there's a very easy donate button here, but you have the option to do a one time or a monthly, and also you can get your name put on the website, you know, depending on what the level you donate at. Let's just look me up here. There we go. Curtis Holtz. You can get yourself put on there as a sign of appreciation. If you made it this far through the video, please put the, what should we do this time? What emoji? Well, it's a celebration video, I suppose. So we'll do the party related emojis. So put a party popper emoji or like the party face in the comments. And that will show me which of you familiar faces did make it this far because the YouTube retention data is nowhere near as fun as an emoji. If you're on Windows, by the way, press the Windows key and the period key and it will bring up an emoji keyboard. Fun little tip. And again, on my side of things, you can check out our modular workspaces add-on. I've got other tools and resources as well, but I think this one will be the most appropriate for you because it's an interface workflow extension to Blender and it's perfectly compatible with 4.4. Watch my last video for information on that. Nice, features galore. Additionally, though this service is not online at the moment, but it may be again one day, if you would like to use me for voice narration for any types of videos, educational content, whatever, then feel free to get in contact because I like being a communicator. It's nice conveying information, getting people excited about things. So yeah, stay safe, have a great day, and I'll see you next time.